Okay, can I hear you? Yeah. This is a continuation of what we were talking about uh, as an introduction to uh, the way that the mind works. And, and the way that the mind works is, is that the news that is presented to us has to be filtered in order for it to be understood that it's kind of boxed in or caged or built around a concept or something that comes out of our past. And that takes time. And the time that it takes to do that processing, we're not actually receiving new data. Okay, just as a computer will read a file and then process it and then read a file, uh, uh, read a, the record and process it and then read another record and processing it. Guess what? If it didn't have to do any processing at all, that it was just straight through. Mm -hmm. Then it's then it's the same as copy speed, mm -hmm. which would be 150 megabytes rather than one or two megabytes. OK, so that's we spend most of our time processing information and thinking about it. And not spend so much processing time just listening or taking an input. So this is where those stages come in, is that when the mind gets very fast and very sophisticated, we can begin to change the habit of the way that we think. And thinking now is defined as taking wrong input and making sense out of it. So this is why those stages like uh, you've heard neither perception or non perception. Mm -hmm. OK, this is what we're talking about there is, is that you can stop so much perception. And start using the data and pipe, pipe it straight in without doing so much uh, adding to. Unprocessed uncooked meat, right? We don't have to we just take it out of wherever it was and serve it. We don't have to <laughs> cook it, all right? And the fire that we're cooking it with may be full of poison. So that's another way of looking at it, OK? That's the Saliatani. So we want to do it two ways. One is, is to always draw the wholesome out for processing and number two, not do so much drawing out of anything out of the sand car or the memory base and just accept that even though we see it and we don't understand it yet, let's just keep looking. Let's mm. start watching what's going on. That in fact, a lot of movies have those kinds of sequences in them to where you have to start watching what's going on to figure it out because the the uh, to protect the director producers trying to give you a visual image of something that's moving. OK, well, guess what? We live in a, a more than a 3D movie. <laughs> it also has smell of vision. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and all of the centuries that they've tried to build into entertainment like that. But what we can do is then we can begin to just enjoy the movie that presents itself. But one of the qualities that we do when we're watching a movie is we subconsciously figure out who we like and who we don't like, and the movie makers make sure that we're on track. The cowboys will have the bad guy in a black hat and the good guy in a white hat. If they both have a mustache, one of them has a blonde mustache, the other one has a black mustache, you know, they just go to town on trying to define who's the villain and who's the hero. Right. But if you're there to watch the movie being made and you're more interested in seeing that, look at what they're doing here there, you know, the costumes are also count. That you look at the costumes of the movie and within just a few minutes, you can figure out who's, you know, what the outcome of this movie is going to be, because those kind of movies are all set up. Well, guess what? The reality also has it set up. If we can start watching what's going on, what is the setup? It's the grand cycles that things are in. Some of the cycles are really slow. Others are very, very interesting. Like there's an information cycle that we're on. 
I don't know the first several rounds of it, but eventually cureforms and the civilization that was built in the time of, um, oh, let us say 9,000 years ago, seven, uh, 7,000 BC, that time, and they were already using mud to write down and keep track of things. So it's information is what I'm talking about. And so writing itself helps spread information in a huge way. And then go forward to the 1400s, and now we've got the Guten uh, uh, movable type printing press. But before that, they had block printing, except that you had to carve a whole page. And so those kind of books were very slow, but they were a whole lot better than having to hand copy everything. And so we had the Gutenberg revolution started a hundred years war. It broke apart Europe. It changed family structures. All kinds of happens because of information flow that changed. Well, then there was another revolution, not for behind that when the Americas came by and there was a whole lot of information and then a whole lot of wars. But let's look at the now we have the Internet and look, the Internet is absolutely um, revolutionizing things along with the cell phone and all of the new technology. And just a few years down the realm is, uh, way is going to be robotics and uh, AGI, general artificial intelligence. And that's really going to change things. And that kind, those kind of changes with the internet and uh, flow of information is why periodically we have kind of worldwide revolutions. We're having another one where Iran and China and Russia <laughs> and the U.S. were all at each other's throats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so these are the cycles of information that, that run and run and run. And when you stop caring about who's doing what, when and where, you can begin to see the grand cycles that things are happening on. Because you don't care what part of the cycle you're on. If you care about what part of the cycle you're on, then you have limited view. We have to stop caring and get away from it. And then we can see it much more clearly, the big things. Okay, so this is the way that we're looking. That's, and the reason that I'm talking about that is because that's a cycle too. Look at the cycling of information and how every time you have an information cycle, the whole society revolves. A whole society revolution happens. Coming out of fossil fuels, that's going to be a whole revolution. And society changes that way. But if anybody likes the way that it is now, boy, they will cling and cling and cling. Yeah, They'll yeah. Tell so many lies and do so many tricks and all kinds of things to try to stop the inevitable from happening. So basically, getting back to Petitia Samupada here, that means then that you can begin to control the way that you see the world rather than having to do it from the perspective of I've got to get my hands off of that thing and then take a rest and wow, all of that. Now we can actually see those cycles. Many of the things that we thought were uh, either too fast or way too slow to be able to see, now we can develop our range of knowledge so that we can see the very, very slow cycles as well as uh, uh, the fast ones. And the human body goes through cycles. Daylight and evening. I mean, look at all the cycles that we go through. So look at what the body is going through when it goes through time cycles. And so this is part of the knowledge that we will bring in. And that all has more to do with observing and paying attention to what's going on, being at the point of consciousness, not so much in, in part of thinking about what we're looking at and just keep looking. We don't have to make it uh, into a concept or wrap it in uh, a, a wrapper or uh, construct a box for it out of Saliata, not at all. We can just see things directly. 
That's where the Buddha's teaching is. And that's when the consciousness becomes boundless because it's not dragging around perception everywhere it goes. That in a way, you've probably heard it like this, that people, this was very common in the 1950s. The uh, idea was is that people only use 10% of their brain. Have you yeah. ever heard anything like that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the answer to that is no. They do use 100% of their brain. They only, but they only use it 10% of the time. The rest of the time, they're trying to figure out what happened and having bad feelings about it. Mm. And so if you really want to use your brain, observe, be in your senses, take in data, take those boundaries and, and things away from it. That's that's the teaching of Paticca Samapada is wisely pay attention. And we start with that and that winds up being all there was to it after all. <laughs> It's just wake up and pay attention to what's going on and stop mulling it over and thinking. But in the process of that, we begin to say, no, the first thing that we've got to do is to change the the, the outcome of, from unwholesome thoughts into wholesome thoughts. That's the first place that we practice. Why? Because if we practice it there of gaining wholesome thoughts one after another, it will eventually change the way that we're feeling. Right away, it changes the way that we're feeling. We can do that within three to five minutes of just practicing everything is okay, everything is fine, well, and we start to chuckle because actually we realize that everything is okay. So that, and so we start at that point. That's the starting point is remove the unwholesome thoughts because then we can begin to manage and control our feelings. Once we're able to control our feelings, then is when we can look in both directions. But in the process of learning to control our feelings, we begin to back up down to the point that we can control the feelings. Like mm -hmm. that, that state of, I like it and I want it, but I'm okay without it. As opposed to, I like it, I want it, and I've got to have it. Right? And so that will begin to teach us, as well as the, uh, the wholesome thoughts together, will get us to the point that we can actually control how we feel about something. And so when you hear two guys arguing, you don't have to get angry and want to take sides. You don't want to have to run away from the two of them. You could just sit and howl with laughter over the absurdities <laughs> both of them are putting out. <laughs> because we're paying attention to it rather than paying attention to the feelings that we have of not liking it angry mm -hmm. yeah you guys shut up <laughs> you know that kind of thing so uh the, at at any point in time the mind may be fit for work at any particular point in the process of patita samapada that we all have to uh be mindful at the point of Tanha. We all have to be mindful at the point of upadana or clinging. We all have to be mindful at the point of uh, uh, Vedana or the feelings. And that's where we're training. And once we get through that, we've already done quite a lot of training on the Salayatana. So the later practice in is beginning to control perception itself, the Nama Rupa. So that we just get rupa, 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 more rupa. Thank you very much. I don't need any descriptions or namas or cases or boxes or, or anything out of the past. I'll just take this present moment like it is. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh -huh. Huh. Now, the last thing to say about this is that we have now, since uh, we've been talking about <clears throat> this part of it, We've actually been talking about the five aggregates. The five aggregates is the body itself, including all the sankaras that are built in the body and all of the other sankaras. We also have the Vedana at the other end of it. And in there also, we have the, uh, the consciousness, 
the perception and the sankaras. Now, the important teaching about this is, is that the self does not exist in any of those places. There is no permanent self in the body that the Hindus, in fact, have magical stuff. I've been to the ceremonies at the burning hats where they turn the uh, where they burn the body. And when the skull gets really going so that a whole lot of the brain is bubbling out of the no out of the nose through boiling, that's when they take their big shillelagh and with great deal of uh, uh, chanting and whatnot. In fact, all the, the Brahmin monks come from all around and they'll all come to this particular corpse together and chant and chant and chant and then whack to break that skull open and raw hot brains and fumes and everything explodes all over those monks <laughs> and rises as steam into the air because that's the releasing of the soul. So that they can go up into the air and go do what it's going to do next. Probably invade bedrooms at night to see what's <laughs> happening. <laughs> That's for another part of the story. But anyway, <laughs> we can recognize that the reality is, is that there is no self. There's no object. There's no soul that's special and unique to me that is going to survive the death of the body. That if it did, it would probably have to have some sort of definition that's equivalent to maybe 10 to the 20th power. A, a 20 digit phone number. To keep so that you don't have any party lines and everybody's got to deal with their own comma, you know, you're the heir of your own comma, right? OK, so how are we going to track that? Well, we need an identifiable object in order to track it. We need to make sure that this football is you, your football, before I kick it in the ass. <laughs> okay, and so this is where the, the idea of the, the self is not the correct point. Uh, the point is soul, that there is no inherent entity in the body, that the bodies just don't happen. They are created out of elements and they will rot back into elements. And the feelings are also temporary, that the body may last 60, 70, 80 years, but feelings, how long do they last? Some people will stew for years, that's true. But, to, but feelings are often more um, flighty than that. But then the high speed one is the mind, in the sense that the mind goes up and down, back and forth, uh, in, in the sense of what state of the mind, and then the then the faster than the speedy bullet is the thoughts that are going through. OK, so in that regard, we attach. We attach to our ideas, we attach to our thoughts, we attach to how we perceive things, we attach to being alive with and we attach to all of these things. But the reality is none of us, none of those things are actually me. None of those things are actually me. At best, I'm temporary anyway, because a lot of the time, whatever is here ain't me. <laughs> it's, it's only when I get irritated that the me arises. And so the whole quality then is let's not irritate things. Let's let things settle down. Let's let the heavy duty suits go all the way to the bottom. And we don't go all the way to the bottom after it. We stay out of the old past. And so that's the teaching of the Petita Samapada. And look, we've actually covered all 12 steps of it. Everything starts with the jiva, ignorance. And as children, we start to learn a whole lot of crap that's no good for us at all. Things that mommy and daddy and grandpa have said, their belief systems get all entangled up in there. And so there's the beginning of the Sankara. So even as little kids, we run around perceiving things that we see incorrectly. How do, what do I mean by perceive? The little kid has to start making sense out of stuff. That's what learning is all about. And a lot of the stuff that we've learned is good stuff. You learn the English language. Okay, so some of it is quite valuable. 
But look how entrenched the English language is, and then you begin to see how entrenched are the way that we feel when we learn the English language. And we, re and we have residue for those kind of feelings based in that Sankara. But that Sankara is not me. We don't take in information well, we don't store it well, and we don't retrieve it well. The Sankara or our memories are at best spotty. A laptop can remember a movie a whole lot better than you can. Every line, every pixel, every word, every note, of, they, a laptop can do it all. And our memories are <laughs> very primitive compared to a laptop. And when we recognize that, we can kind of accept it. That's the way humans are. That humans are totally inadequate. And, there, and the reason that I say that is because that's how they feel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they don't have to feel that way at all. It's your choice about how you're going to feel. Mm -hmm. But the one thing's for sure, and that is, is that those that memory base that you have is not who you are. If you thought so, then that would define you to completely and you'd have no choice over your destiny. You are ground in, bound down, you were a slave to your own style that developed in early childhood. The answer to that is no, we can change. That's what the, that's why the Buddha bothered to figure out for teacher Samapad is to recognize, hey, we could tweak this thing here and there. In fact, we could tweak it every place. <laughs> <laughs> Now, when we get to the point where we can just receive data and not process it, the, this is also referred to as uh, the scene is merely the scene, mm. or the herd is merely the herd, or the cognized is merely the cognized, because it doesn't go down that path through perception to salayatana, to the, uh, to the contact, to the vedana, uh, and and down into the uh, upadana and down that that hill okay that it can that in fact the place that's best to rest is just in sensory input just be here now just absorb what's going on and there's quite a lot happening <laughs> and when we just receive it as it is we don't have to have any feelings about it because we didn't process the data, we just took it in. And that's a, um, what is it, ta-ta-ta, ta-ta-ta? Ta-ta-ta, exactly, ta-ta-ta, ta -ta -ta. right. this is it, this is, this is <laughs> it, and that's all we're doing is just taking it in, ta-ta-ta, this is it, the thusness, not the processed. But that's going to take some practice. The first thing that we need to do is to get those um, discursive thoughts lined up one after another. Begin to control the mind so that you can have one wholesome thought after another after another, and that gives us control over the feelings. Once we have control over the body as comfortable and relaxed, controlling the feelings as being in a state of sukha, at a state of peace, at a state of pity, that wow kind of state. That's the first jhana, and that's when the mind is now fit for work to go di diving into the early parts of Paticca Samapada. Because why? If the mind is fit for work, that means that we already feel the way that we want to feel. We don't have to worry about that anymore. Because that whole uh, area is closed off. The second half of Paticca Samapada no longer exists. We cut the thing in half by controlling the feelings. And then we can go into the deeper stuff. And the way that we cut the feelings off altogether is by stopping the perception. Because if we don't perceive anything, then that means we're not trying to make sense out of anything. We're not trying to box the... Uh, uh, the information, we're just leaving it as it is, so there's nothing much to feel about it. So 
So this is the teacher Samapada. What do you think? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, that was. That's interesting. Uh, that answers a lot of the questions that I had. Um, it feels like some, in some situations that are, I guess, more difficult. That there's more ignorance to like the, the earlier part of it. If um, there's a lot of things that are kind of trigger me, I guess, you know, or I'm distracted. Mm -hmm. But in other situations, um, it's clear. OK, well, never mind. Start again. Keep yeah. practicing. Have yeah. fun. <laughs> Start having some hopes and thoughts one after another. That's going to start in the middle and work in both directions. Mm hmm. OK. Mm hmm. The waking up process so you can wake up to the to the cycle that you're on. Yeah. You get off that cycle and then you start waking up to the cycles themselves and that's when you can kind of let it go. That's the relinquishment. That in the Anapanasati Sutta, it talks about it in the sense of anicca, to see that things are, are in samsara, and then recognize that these cycles wear out, that you get to the bottom of the cycle again, and so things die out. And in fact, what really dies out is you're caring about it, and so you give it up, you relinquish it. Because mm. everything is in a cycle, everything that you find alive is going to die. That life death cycle, we can see it on the merry go round, we can see it in the Republican Party. They thought they were really going to live and party, and they find out that no, they died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so um, these are the cycles, and we can see those cycles once we stop attaching. And the cycles that we can see then are based upon how fast we are of catching the mind in its process. Mm -hmm. And yet, it's, if you can gain the first jhana, then it's very, fairly easy to just stop the mind and be in sensory input and just allow sensory input to just be without having to think about it or anything else. You just let input come. That's why it becomes uh, in the sutras, they call it infinite. It's not infinite. It's just <laughs> here it comes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a flood. It's boundless, mm. but it's not infinite because we'll all die anyway. <laughs> yeah. So let's go ahead and finish this call. I think that, do you have any final questions? Anything to, uh, any doubts? <laughs> any doubts? No, no. There's, uh, there's no reason to doubt, right? Right. No yeah. doubt about it. The mind works this way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So next time you call, we'll, we'll talk about how that issue about the doubt fits in. In mm -hmm. the sense that, uh, hearing what I'm talking about sounds logical to everybody, but we mm -hmm. have to do it and practice it and see these various steps over and over again so that there's not a doubt about it. Mm. And the doubt is in two ways. One is, is that I can see what it is. And number two, that's the way that it is. So both of them have to do with reality. And that's where the the uh, end of doubt comes. Mm. Yeah, it does seem like like it, it seems like like a problem comes in my life, and then it's like, oh, I can I, I can you know uh, once I I'm able to have wholesome thoughts and do anapanasati is like, okay, I'm fine now. But then it recurs later, yeah. right. and then. And so never mind, you did Anapanasati yeah. one time, you can do it yeah. again. Yeah, it's going to keep coming back. That's yeah. the whole point. That's why Anapanasati has to keep coming back. Yeah. You have to scrub the pot when it's dirty. You can't clean it one time and then go off cooking all the time without getting dirty again. You got to keep cleaning. That's why we call it yeah. rinse and repeat. You got to keep doing it over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> mm hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, Spurgeon. We will see you later. Thank you, Tom Roger. Thank you. Remember so to repeat over and over again. It works. Watch it work this time too. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. -bye.